Daniel Boone, the famed frontiersman and explorer, was once asked if he'd ever been lost. He said, no, but I was once a mite bewildered for three days. <laughs> As a researcher, I don't mind being lost or bewildered, but as a teacher, I do. I'll tell you, in the physical world, I now can navigate better than Daniel Boone. But I've got maps. I've got a GPS. I won't get bewildered, well, at least not for three days. But as an educational, uh, as an educator, as a teacher, I don't have the time to get bewildered for three days when I'm in front of a classroom filled with students. I don't have much to lead me, though, as a teacher. I have, at most, a set of standards or maybe an order in which to teach them. That's sort of like having road signs, but road signs are not enough. We need maps for our cognitive world to lead us. So I'm a psychometrician, an educational engineer. I use mathematics to build tools for teachers, like tests, just like a structural engineer will use mathematics to design a bridge for motorists to use. But we've got some additional problems in helping teachers not get lost. One of the things we do a lot as psychometricians is we create score scales. So 200 to 800, 1 to 36, 120 to 170. What do these numbers mean? Those are the score scales, by the way, for the SAT, the ACTs, and the GREs. But what does a score of 340 on the SAT mathematics mean? If I have two students who have a score of 27 on the ACTs, do they know the same things? Do I teach them the same way? Throw in some additional variables, like different learning styles, different teaching styles, different groups of children in the classroom with different needs. It's no wonder we get lost. We need maps to help us navigate them. And so, at the Achievement and Assessment Institute, at the University of Kansas, we decided to build them. We had a specific problem that we needed to solve. Education of students with significant cognitive disabilities. And they have assessments called alternate assessments. These students are the approximately 1% of students with the greatest learning challenges. They might have IQs below 55, severe autism, and other disabilities that get in the way of their ability to process information. On top of that, there's a lot of comorbidity with physical disabilities, motor disabilities, blindness, deafness. More than anyone else, these students need teachers who have maps to help them find their way. We were funded about five years ago for a project to develop an alternate assessment called Dynamic Learning Maps Alternate Assessment. And we worked with a group of 18 states and soon a 19th state, New York, is going to be joining us this year. We founded this assessment on a number of key principles to try to avoid the problems that we've had in the past with assessment. And perhaps the most profound of those is the use of learning maps. So this is the math. Wasn't used to the transition, sorry. So this is the mathematics learning map we developed. It has over 2,500 nodes and 5,300 connections. We affectionately refer to it as a hairball <laughs> and thought it would be so off-putting that we could never show it to any teacher or they'd run screaming from the room. However, we had 100 teachers help us review these maps. And we were wrong. They wanted to take it home and start using it immediately, though not in exactly that form. 
See, they realized something that we didn't. If you want to navigate from Kansas City to St. Louis, you don't use a physical map of the world. Instead, you need to zoom in and use a road map of Missouri. Similarly, a seventh grade math teacher doesn't need to look at all of math in order to decide what to teach and how to teach it. They don't even need to look at all of seventh grade math to do that. <clears throat> Perhaps the teacher wants to do a lesson related to number systems. And one of the first things the teacher might want to do is check the prerequisite skills of their children. Are their children ready to learn this yet? Because if they haven't learned the basic building blocks, the things that came before, you're wasting your time trying to teach it now. Perhaps in their classroom, they had some students who learned differently than the typical student. Perhaps they needed to look and find an alternate pathway within this smaller section of the map to help a student who's a visual learner or who's deaf. Maybe there's a different and a better way to do that. And so we needed to make sure our map had multiple pathways to address these needs. But now they zoom in a little bit further. And they're ready to use the map to plan a unit on addition of rational numbers. And to check the progress of each student as that student is moving forward. So now they are in a better position than before, but they still needed some more tools, some more help, some more structure to the map. So we created something called essential elements. Those are the grade level targets that we're trying to bring each student to. And we created five levels for each one of those targets so that no child would not have an achievable goal on that pathway to the ultimate goal of learning for that grade. It's like you're leading people through the wilderness. Back to Daniel Boone again. If you're already over the next two hills and out of sight, you're not leading anymore. So we need those intermediate goals. And now we have a manageable structure for teachers with these five levels for anything that they might be working on. And there might be no more than 100 of them for all of the instruction a particular teacher might do. So they become more and more familiar with these little mini maps as they go forward. And teachers have told us this is working for them. With these maps, teachers are less likely to get lost. They need to decide where they're going, see where they are, and figure out the proper route to take. And they have the tools to do that. Not having teachers get lost mean, as navigators and pilots like to say, students will stay found. And special needs students will have the detours necessary for them to take a different path through the map, but still get to the ultimate goals that we're trying to bring them to. We've got another problem, of recent, a bigger problem. We have embedded our assessments into accountability systems that are guiding our teachers to do things that we don't intend them to do. Often, Teachers are teaching to the test, and these are tests that were never intended to be taught to. And so teachers are drilling and practicing on these same things for all students. And they stop teaching a month or two before the end of the school year and start preparing people for the exams. We know this is not good education. We do it anyway because the way the tests have been set up. What can we do to prevent this? To paraphrase H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there's a simple solution. And it's wrong. <laughs> so when I say the solution is to create tests worth teaching to, I don't want you to think that's an easy thing to do. It isn't. I would argue that in order to do it well, you're going to need learning maps. You're going to need more than that you're going to need tests that are spread through the school year so you don't just wait till the end of the year, do your assessment then, when it's too late to use that information to any productive purpose. Because our tests 
are based on learning maps, which in turn are based on cutting edge, edge research in how children learn and how they learn best. We now have a situation where instruction is driving assessment to replace our current problem of assessment driving instruction. But now we have another issue. How do we assure that the test is actually based on the learning map? It's easy to say, how do you actually do it? Well, we do that by developing structures for our test developers just like we did for our uh, teachers. What we need to do is take those five-level mini-maps and combine them with other information to guide our test developers. Information such as, what's the vocabulary we want students to be using, which means, what's the vocabulary we want teachers to be using, to think about these ideas. So that the idiosyncratic language that one teacher might use in a particular place doesn't interfere with a child's ability to show what he or she knows and can do. In addition to vocabulary, we can have some ideas as to what kind of questions should we be asking to get at this particular topic. We can create templates and have done that. And so now we have a coherent system that has been developed. Well, going back to Mencken, it's still not simple. We need statistical models that are consistent with this new way of doing things. In the old world, what we've always done with assessment is add up the number of questions someone answered correctly, get a number based on that, put it on one of those scales that have no meaning that I talked to you about before. How do we avoid doing this? We need a different statistical model. <clears throat> and thank goodness, Sir Thomas Bayes comes to our rescue. Thomas Bayes was a, um, a, an English Presbyterian minister in uh, the early 1700s, and he was also a statistician. He got into statistics because he wanted to use statistics to prove the existence of God, trying to merge his two fields into one. <clears throat> and Bayes', Bayes uh, theorem, which you see in front of you, uh, evolved into something called Bayesian network analysis. And it's used for fields as diverse as figuring out consumer preferences, identifying national security risks, or determining the probability a student has mastered the nodes in a learning map. So then we need to report our results. We had systematic discussions with parents and teachers because, frankly, they were not very happy about the kinds of reports they've had in the past. Didn't know what to do with those numbers. So we created new types of reports that were concrete, understandable, and actionable. <clears throat> Told teachers what to do. No more figuring out what a score of 27 means. In fact, reports that could suggest what the next area of study might be uh, in the classroom. So here we have an example of such a report. Blue indicates areas that the child has mastered. Red indicates areas the child is currently being instructed on. White indicates what's to come in the future. Now, you can't read any of the details there, but if you were a parent and received a report like this, you'd know what your child can do, and you'd know what's coming up for that child. And particularly if you were a parent with child <clears throat> with significant cognitive disabilities where you've never really understood what's going on in the school while education is taking place, this is a brand new world. And so parents really love this. They now could understand their child's progress. In fact, we can go beyond that. Future reports can be dynamic in nature. Here, blue represents we're sure the child has mastered a particular node, <clears throat> similar to the last one. Red here indicates something different. It indicates we're sure the child has not mastered that node. We have enough information to know they have a need there. The intermediate colors, yellow and orange, indicate that that is something we're not yet sure about. It might be we're not sure because we haven't done any probing assessment to find out. It might be we're not sure because the child is in the midst of learning that content and they've not yet solidified their knowledge. As the school year progresses, colors in the map change to show the child's growth. 
We started with students with significant cognitive disabilities, but there's no reason that this approach can't be appropriate for all children. In fact, we've had two additional projects after that first one, and we are now expanding the map and English language arts and mathematics to be appropriate for all students through 12th grade. We're also developing tools that can be used to help teachers use the map themselves to help them tag materials to the maps. The map can become an organizing structure. So when you're going to teach a lesson on a particular topic, click on that area of the map. Oh, you're not sure if you have to backtrack and, and help students learn something that they missed or they didn't really solidify that knowledge. Go back in the map one step and see what you need to go over. You might need some formative assessments to do some of that probing during learning to see if it's working. And you click on that node of the map or a group of nodes that you've put together. You can do that. You can have professional development materials that you tag to the map. In fact, with our latest project where we're doing this, the goal is to provide these tools not only to the teachers in the states that we're going to be working with, but eventually that this would become a commercial product so that people who develop educational materials could use our map to tag their materials to create that organizing structure for their lesson plans, their examples, their, to their tools uh, in order to allow a consistent framework for this to be done. They could also use it to develop new maps, maps of their own. We have English language arts and mathematics right now. We're working on science, but there could be other areas too. In fact, there's no need to limit this to K-12 education. We're right now contemplating a project at KU where we would map out all of the data sciences at KU. We have many different departments that teach courses in data sciences. Let's bring all of that information together in one place. Among other things, it'll allow us to determine redundancies that exist, but it'll also allow <coughs> programs to determine what might be the best order in which to offer courses. The probability of success increases when you do things in a way that build on the previous knowledge and decreases if it's a hodgepodge, if it's random. It's not just formal education. We're also in discussions right now with a national medical licensure board. They're interested in using some of the approaches that we've been developing uh, to help better test people and protect the public to make sure that people who come out, professionals who are licensed, truly know the skills that they need to know. We could use this in workplace skills development. In fact, some of the early work that went on was in the military uh, with the training of uh, people who do uh, repairs of hydraulic systems in military equipment. So maps are a familiar metaphor. They help people understand structure, complex structure around them. We can do so much more when we know where we are, where we're going, and more than a single pathway to get there. We have children, workers, professionals, and they're all too valuable to allow them to get lost. We need to give them the tools to stay found. Learning maps, we know will help them find their way. Thank you.